So for the past four or five weeks, we've been spending an extensive amount of time going through the Java Streams framework. We talked quite a bit about Parallel Streams. I showed you how Parallel Streams was implemented internally and how Streams worked. We've talked about the fork join pool. And now we're going to kind of shift our focus to a, a whole different way of programming parallel and computing applications, uh, parallel and concurrent applications using something called completable futures. In order to understand completable futures, it's very useful to understand something called the reactive programming model, which you may have heard about, you may have used. And I'll give you an overview here to kind of set the stage for the discussions of completable futures. As you can see, reactive programming corresponds to four key principles, responsive, resilient, elastic, and message driven. And uh, one of those four things doesn't really quite fit the way the other ones do, but we'll talk about that in a second. So what is reactive programming? Well, if you haven't uh, had a chance, you might want to take a look at reactive programming uh, descriptions, which you can find on Wiki. There's also a reactive programming manifesto. Anytime anybody wants to sort of throw down the gauntlet, you know, like Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses on the door of the, the church to start the Reformation, uh, you have a manifesto. And that means you're really serious about this and what a big change it's going to make. So reactive programming is essentially an asynchronous programming model or paradigm that's primarily concerned with processing streams of data and propagating changes to things that care about those changes in some way or another. There are four key principles in the reactive programming model, or these are the ones that are covered in the reactive manifesto, responsive, resilient, elastic, and message driven. So let's talk about each of these things in turn. The first principle is responsive. What that means is you want to be able to give rapid and consistent response time. So the opposite of responsive would be something like batch. So back in the old days, if you wanted to do a computer program, because remember we just talked a little while ago about how hardware was really the, the premium back in the day. So back in the day, hardware was important, so people would spend time you know, totally trying to fill up every last nanosecond of the computer, and so they ran batch jobs in order to do that. And that was efficient in terms of you know, maximizing the computer, but it would take a long time to get a response because you'd have to wait for your job to run in the queue. So in contrast, reactive programming wants rapid and consistent response times, response times. And that's often because these applications are used in environments where you're interacting with people through websites or mobile devices. And so they want quick feedback. They want to know. They want to get the search results. They want to figure out what the weather is. They want to figure out, you know, can they book a uh, play or whatever. Another thing you might want to try to do is have some kind of upper bound on how it long it takes to give a response and to make sure that your responses are fairly predictable and dependable. You don't delay things in an undue way. Uh, if you work with computers long enough, you've probably encountered either the hourglass icon, which means things are busy, or on Windows, they have like this spinning color wheel. Those are indications that stuff is taking a while to run, and you shouldn't expect the results right away. So we don't like that kind of thing. People get frustrated nowadays with non-responsive systems. So responsiveness is one of the key principles. Another principle is resilient. And what that means is that the system will <coughs> respond with some results, even if something goes wrong. So you, you certainly don't want your system just to hang. And you really don't want your system to totally crash just because one thing went wrong. And this is often one of the biggest challenges when you first start learning to program. And uh, you know, for many of the programs that you write for the Vanderbilt assignments, we're not really trying to make them absolutely bulletproof. You want them to kind of get the computations done. You want to learn about you know, asymptotic time complexity or some um, searching or sorting algorithm or whatnot. But you're not worried about handling every imaginable error case. Production systems, in contrast, spend an enormous amount of time worrying about handling all the error cases, because you don't want things to stop working. And uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk in a minute about how Java Completable Futures addresses all these issues. But this is the requirement list, or the, the principles. Another goal is to have the system be responsive even as the workload varies, and especially as the workload goes up. You'd like to make it be the case that as the workload goes up, the system will kind of automatically scale the performance, or auto-scale, or auto-tune the performance to keep working even though we've got more work, we want to be able to kind of shed that load and load balance and 
bring in more resources, more cores, more computers, more whatevers, in order to get the processing to, to scale up gracefully. And then the last principle is message-driven. And this is kind of a weird principle relative to the other ones. The other ones all are all about, you know, low latency, you know, robustness in the face of points of failure, um, auto scaling. Those are all sort of properties that you could kind of measure quantitatively. Whereas message driven is really sort of more of an implementation detail. And it's just saying that we want to be able to pass messages around between components in an asynchronous way in order to keep them loosely coupled, in order to isolate them. So a failure in one won't affect a failure in another or the behavior of another. We want to kind of make it possible so we could have some location transparency. You don't really care what core or what computer the work runs on. You just want to keep them loosely coupled. So that, that's kind of more of an implementation property, whereas the other three are more about performance, key performance indicators, KPIs. So how, does, how do completable futures actually map onto these four principles, right? If those are important principles of reactive programming, what is it that completable futures is going to do to help you? Now, admittedly, we haven't talked a lot about what a completable future is yet, so this is a bit premature, but imagine completable futures are these wonderful things that address all these concerns. Here's, at a high level, what they're going to do. Um, to be more responsive, the completable future model will go to a, quite a bit of lengths to avoid blocking user code. So we don't want the user code to block, which means we don't want it to wait and have the user application have to wait. That helps things be more responsive. So by not having blocking in the user code, that will help us utilize the cores more effectively because we can keep things running. It'll help to enhance the inherent parallelism in the system by just keeping more things running, not only cores, but also the I.O. subsystem, having things move effectively from cores to I.O. input and output devices and so on. And another tricky thing with blocking is that it can make your program more complicated in some ways, because you have to figure out how to block stuff, and, and you have to figure out how many threads to have, and it gets really complicated. I'll talk more about that shortly. So one thing that completable futures are going to do is not block user code. And in fact, the completable futures provide a bunch of mechanisms that do just this. We'll see shortly what these things mean in more detail, but we have factory methods, completion stage methods, and so-called arbitrary arity methods. And these are all the mechanisms that are available in completable futures to avoid blocking the user code. And I'll talk about them all in a lot more detail, of course. Uh, but at a high level, that's the goal, is to have features in the framework that avoid blocking in user code. Uh, another thing that you can do, and this is sort of more of an optional thing, because you can either choose to do this or not with computable futures, is we also want to avoid changing between threads. Um, why might you want to avoid this, you might ask? Well, the reason you want to avoid changing threads is when you start having a computation that moves between different threads, you can have overhead arise due to synchronization, context switching, memory management, cache management. These are all sort of these invisible impediments or invisible overheads that make your program slow down. And so if you're really thoughtful about how you do it, you can use the completable futures framework in a way that will not move things back and forth between threads. You'll have them running separately in different threads. <clears throat> and um, the way this works is that there's a set of methods that are part of the fork join pool, and they're exposed up to you through the completable futures API that gives you a choice over whether or not you want the computations to move between threads or not. So if you tell it not to move things between threads, it'll try to run in a common thread. If you say, move it between threads, it'll then decide if it chooses to move things between threads. Yes? So when I out thread ceiling, what is thread ceiling? Work ceiling. Oh, work ceiling, no. Um, yes and no, what'll, what'll that, well actually that's a very good question. So. Um, the way that you'll see this working is, depending on which methods you use, it will try to run the next computation that occurs after an asynchronous operation completes in the, co in the same thread of control. Um, if there's other work that's in the deck, those things can still be stolen. 
and they can still run. But it really has more to do with what happens after an asynchronous computation completes, where's the next computation going to take place in the chain of computations? And if you use the non-async versions, it'll try to keep it in the same thread where the thing just finished. If you use the async version, it says, up, oh, anything goes, let it run anywhere it wants to. And so you can kind of play around and, and tune that. That's a good question, though. The next property, resilience. Remember, resilience means no single point of failure, or the failure in one thing doesn't cause everything else to come crashing down. And the way that works, of course, um, is going to be by using exceptions. So we'll see shortly that there's some really cool exception handling features built into completable futures. And their whole purpose is to make it easier to write code that will catch errors that occur in asynchronous computations and then direct the flow of control to some place to handle them in as graceful a way as you can. Um, turns out handling exceptions in parallel and asynchronous code is, is always tricky, but at least we have a way to do it. Does anybody remember what this guy is in the middle? I think that was the, uh, the T-1000 Terminator from the movie Terminator 2. And uh, if you've ever seen Terminator 2, which by the way is a great movie, um, he could be shot and he would just like reform, right? So he was resilient. He didn't, there was no single point of failure, except if you put him in a vat of like molten, you know, molten lead, then he'll melt. So that was the way they got rid of him at the end. Um, as you need to remember that completable futures are always localized to a single process, not in a cluster, but we still want to make sure that those different, um, the different computations running on different cores in parallel won't bring the whole system down if one of them goes awry. Elastic really means that asynchronous computations can run scalably in a pool of computational resources like worker pool threads in the fork join pool. And the way this works under the hood is that we can have a fork join pool, a common fork join pool, or even some custom thread pool. You don't have to use the fork join pool at all. You could use a fixed thread pool or a cache thread pool. But you can, you can dictate how the processing takes place. Keep in mind, again, that everything's still running on one machine and one process, but you can kind of dictate how it scales up on the different threads that are available. And then the final mapping of the final principle, which I said before is that, that weird one that doesn't really fit with the other ones, which is message-driven. If you take a look at the internals of the fork join pool, then internally it's passing the various tasks around between these decks, these work queues, using a message-oriented model. So the implementation of the fork join pool is message-oriented using these work queue decks, or double-ended queues, even though the programming abstraction that you see as a developer is a method-oriented abstraction. So you make method calls, but those are converted internally to use messages. Like I said before, this is really sort of a kind of a goofy uh, principle in some sense. Now, it turns out, that, as I'll show you in a second, there's a couple of different ways of expressing reactive programming in Java 8 and Java 9. Java 9 being a, new, a newer, newer version of Java. Not the most recent version, but it's a newer version. And Java 9, J Java 8 has support for reactive programming with completable futures, but Java 9 goes one step further and adds some new capabilities that allow what are called reactive streams. And the way it's done is with something called the Flow API. And it's got a bunch of classes. It basically has these publishers, subscribers, and subscriptions, and so on. And in a nutshell, what you get is stream-oriented publish subscribe, where you can have subscribers that tell publishers how many items they want to take. And then the publishers can publish the items to the subscribers. So there's sort of a control flow and a data flow back and forth here. And essentially, this particular programming abstraction combines two classic gang of four patterns, one of which is iterator, which lets you kind of pull items from a source. And the other is observer, where you can push items to subscribers. So that's kind of the model. It's a publish-subscribe style model. And oddly enough, this is kind of weird. Java 9 support for reactive streams is very, very minimal. It just provides a bunch of sort of interfaces, really, and maybe one class. And the purpose there is really not for you to program with Java 9 
Flow API directly, but instead it's to provide an interoperable foundation for other reactive programming frameworks, such as RxJava, such as Akka, and so on. And so it really is, the jury is still out as to how much people take advantage of the Java 9 features in these other frameworks. But at least in theory, they're, they're there to make it easier over time to have a common reactive streams model for what that's worth. So here's a little table that sort of summarizes all the different pieces. This, this talks about all the things we've covered so far, assuming we've covered a little tiny bit about reactive streams. So the, the diagram here has an X and Y axis. The X axis is going from synchronous communication to asynchronous or synchronous processing or computation to asynchronous processing and computation on the one hand. And then over here we have single value processing versus multiple value processing. So let's take a look at the simplest example. So classic Java objects that you've all programmed with since CS101 or the equivalent. So in that case, you have a single value that comes back, the return value, and it's synchronous. The thread of control of the, call, of the uh, caller is borrowed by the callee to do the processing. And when it's done, it returns the result and the control continues where the caller made the call. So that's, that's just really simple, classic Java 101 stuff. You look at streams, and this includes parallel streams, as being synchronous, but you can also have multiple values because a stream is a stream of values, right? Stream of elements, stream of data, stream of values. So there can be multiple values that are processed synchronously. And if you think about the parallel streams model, the way that's done is that each of the different threads in the fork join pool will pull the data sources through all the different processing operations, the aggregate operations, are used to process the data that's pulled synchronously by the threads from the data sources. So these are sort of the classic approaches. Over here, what I've colored in yellow is what we would consider reactive programming. Completable futures are an asynchronous way of doing computation. But again, as we'll see shortly, they have a single value result. So you do an operation, and it gives you a result back, and then you can chain together a bunch of com so-called completion stages or dependent actions that get triggered when an earlier action completes. So that's what completable futures do. So that's a form of reactive programming. And then we've also got other forms of reactive programming, such as reactive streams, which in fact allow multiple values and are asynchronous. And then we have this interesting sort of hybrid approach where we can take a sequential stream and combine it with a completable future. So then you can actually have multiple values that are being processed in a stream-like way, but they're being handled asynchronously. And we'll take a closer look at that with a couple of really cool examples that we'll get to a little bit later. OK, so that's kind of the high-level view. That's an overview of reactive programming and then a mapping of that onto some of the capabilities in completable futures. I don't expect at this point you'll have a very good idea of what a completable future is because we haven't really talked about them in anything other than a highly abstract way. But I just wanted to kind of orient the discussion in terms of other popular paradigms that you may have heard about or may have had a chance to play around with.